Okay, guys. So um, thank you for signing the three-day exploits class. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have everything you need to go and uh, find some vulnerabilities and develop exploits for them. So as all of you know uh, from before, I believe everyone in here, yeah, I recognize all of you took the exploits one class. Um, I'm Corey Kallenberg. I'm from the Colorado Springs site, which is currently, you know, on fire right now, a whole wildfires. Um, I'm basically like a host security guy. I don't really play in the network field. Um, I learned most of my security skills and exploit development skills through participating in war game like exploit contests. And uh, for me, I mainly do um, trusted computing and rootkit research. And I also do some exploit mitigation research and stuff like that. And uh, also, as you probably figured out from last time, I'm really bad at PowerPoint. I just um, mainly just copy and paste screenshots and slides, but I really won't be using the PowerPoint too much because, as you know, this is a lab tripping course and we mainly mean the Winky Bug whole class. So I'll be like Winky Bug. So in Exploits 1, we talked about exploitation in the Linux environment, and Exploits 2 is all in Windows. We will only be in Windows, and it turns out things in Windows are a lot hairier than they are in Linux for a number of reasons. And we're going to sort of show you uh, all the sort of uh, all the hoops you have to jump through in Windows. And by the end of this course, you'll basically have all the tools you need to find and exploit some uh, client-side type vulnerabilities in, um, in Windows applications. I'll mainly be focusing on this sort of paradigm of exploiting client-side applications, like when you try to render a document or something like that, just because it makes it easier for the class and helps me avoid having to go over too much reverse engineering, because uh, reverse engineering is not a requirement for this course. So, um, with that said, by the end of this course, you will have everything you need to find vulnerabilities and develop exploits, so please be smart with what you do with them. Um, we should all be responsible here. Don't do anything stupid. So don't go to your manager and say, Corey made me do it, because I'm not going to endorse them. Okay, uh, another important part of this is we're going to be talking about all the um, exploit mitigation technologies deployed in Windows and how you get around all those as well. In uh, Windows, you have to deal with a lot of um, crappy stuff like General stack protection, um, depth, variable reordering, blah, blah, blah. I can't even remember them all. But on day two, we're going to go through uh, what each of those are, what their weaknesses are, and how we can bypass them with our exploit payloads. Okay, so um, most of you in here took exploits one, so you should be aware of the course prerequisites. You have to be good at x86. I'm not going to go over any of that. You should um, basically know the basics of stack overflows. I'm not really going to talk about that either. Um, this isn't too important. As long as you've used Windows, that's fine. If you've used WinDebug, that's even better, but uh, don't worry about that one too much. And um, hopefully, we have all used a debugger in here, probably GDB. And for this course, we'll be using uh, WinDebug exclusively. There are other debuggers used for this type of things, like Immunity Debugger, but um, I prefer WinDebug, and it's actually a really good, powerful debugger once you learn how to use it. Okay, so the course outline in the slides is actually um, is, does not reflect exactly the course we're going to take in this class. I decided to change things up a little bit as I was teaching this in the plane because I think you'll like uh, the new direction a little bit better. So for day one, we are going to sort of, the first half of the day, we'll be reviewing what we already know, kind of like stack overflows in uh, Windows, just kind of like redoing what we did in exploits one, but in Windows, just so you get familiar with WinDebug and um, kind of learn the uh, how Windows works and all that kind of stuff. So the uh, first part of day one will be a little bit slow, hopefully won't bore you too much. Originally I was going to go over um, Windows shell code on the second half of day two, because Windows shell code is super gnarly, way gnarlier than Linux shell code. But um, I'm actually not going to talk about that. And the reason is I don't have a lot of good labs for the Windows shell code thing since it is so kind of hairy and contrived. But I do have very descriptive slides in here. So if you do any type of malware analysis, I highly recommend you go over those slides and I even have some lab type material in the um, course documents that you can look at. Because a lot of the uh, techniques you see being used in Windows shell code will also appear in Windows malware. And I will talk briefly about the um, differences at a high level once we get there. Okay, so day number two is going to be all about um, Windows exploit mitigations and how those are bypassed. We'll sort of systematically go down the list of what Windows tries to throw in our way as exploit developers and how we get around them. And the day two lab will basically be where we uh, develop an exploit that for a vulnerability we um, exploited it the first day, but with all the uh, mitigations turned on. 
and uh, we'll modify our payload to get past past everything. That'll be kind of like an all day lab because it uh, takes some doing to accomplish that. Okay, uh, day number three is going to be all about fuzzing. So I wrote an application, Corey's do uh, crappy document reader, similar to Corey's crappy allocator, which does something like renders a document with some graphics and some text, and it'll be fuzzing it for vulnerabilities. And um, importantly, that's going to be kind of like an all-day lab where we talk about um, generating crashes and analyzing those crashes to see if we think they're exploitable or not, and I'll talk about being exploitable and plugins like that. And a new thing on here, which I um, introduced in the McLean class, which isn't in your slides, is we're going to uh, be using this unpatched Windows XP virtual machine where we fuzz for um, some old vulnerabilities in Windows XP and then develop exploits for them. So that uh, unpatched virtual machine is completely unpatched. Don't use it for anything real because you'll definitely get owned. Uh, no browser on the internet on it. But we're going to go and try to um, rediscover some of these old vulnerabilities develop payloads for them. So I think uh, you guys will like that because the McLean class likes it a lot. Okay, uh, as of exploits one, this is a very lab-driven course. I could be up here all day talking to you, and if uh, you just listen to me, you would totally forget it within like a week. But if you actually do it, hopefully it will stick with you longer. Um, one kind of new thing with this class is in exploits one, I kind of just had like two marathon days, and a lot of the feedback I got suggested that you guys wanted a little bit slower pace. Um, and maybe not some marathon days, which is part of why I made this uh, three days. So I could try to end a little bit earlier. So instead of ending at 5.30, maybe try to end up at 3.30 or 4. And uh, that should give some extra time for anyone that's having problems to stick around. I can uh, go over the material again that we covered that day. And anyone that felt comfortable with it, they can just leave. So that's the plan, but we'll see how it plays out. The playing class day one ran kind of long, and days two and three were um, in around 3 o'clock. We'll see. So please put as much effort into the labs as you can. That is really how you're going to digest this material by just attempting the labs. Okay. So this is the first uh, program that we're going to be exploiting, uh, Basic Foam. So if you fire up your virtual machines, which I'll do now, um, in this C colon slash class directory, you'll find uh, Basic Foam. And in the release directory, um, you'll find the Basic Foam binary. Essentially what it does is it um, reads in a file and then you know tries to just display the hex dump of the file. So kind of like a really crappy uh, hex dump thing and there's no secret in where the vulnerability is in this. I'm giving the source code. And it's a very vanilla stack overflow. Just re-familiarizing ourselves with the basics here. And that'll be the first thing that we're uh, working on exploiting. But I promise that uh, things will get more exciting and harder as the class progresses. So let's go ahead and open up our virtual machines, which should be on your desktop. And the first one we're going to be looking at is the Exploits 2 VM. Like I said before, don't mess up, don't mess too much with the unpatched VM, because it'll definitely get hacked. And then just open up the, uh, the VMX file. And um, Should we be running with dev on? Dev off right now, which is what I was about to show you. So when you reboot the system, you'll present, be presented with a menu when it's coming up, uh, dev on or dev off, which is like the new XP stack thing that we talked about in exploits one. We're just going to turn that off for now. Um, so kind of cheesy, but I promise uh, by day two we'll be turning that back on and having everything on. So it'll be the uh, real deal. But for now, dev off as we're learning the basics. Okay, so in the C class, um, or well, the basic phone directory, you can even like look at the uh, the basic phone solution file. I'm giving the source code for this one and kind of see where the vulnerability is. Um, in this case, um, very obviously, I'm like uh, reading in 128 bytes right here, which is called the fread into a 64 byte buffer. And so in exploits 2, all of our payloads are going to be coming in from files. All right. So in exploits 1, we often have to use Perl on the command line to um, craft some crazy command line argument. So for this, we're just putting it into a file. 
and I'm using like a hex editor to um, help modify the file. And I have some tools in there too to help generate these uh, these files with arbitrary and binary contents. So um, this should uh, not be too interesting for us. By the end of the class, I won't be giving the source code anymore because in Windows we usually don't have access to the source code for the uh, programs we're trying to exploit. And uh, also what I have in here that I want to show you is this byte writer program in the C colon slash class directory. And um, you don't have to use this if you want to. It just helps you generate, like I said, these files full of arbitrary binary contents. And so right now the file is set up to um, generate um, some huge amount of OX dead beef in a file. So if I were to um, to run that, what this will do is generate that um, that file, which is kind of be kind of like my uh, starting place for building a payload, 128 bytes of dead beef. And HXD is the hex editor we'll be using. It's super easy to use. You just type in what you want the contents to be and control F to save. So I believe there's um, some command line stuff on here you could use, like through Sigwin, if you want to use something like Perl to build your payloads. But if you want to just modify Byte Writer to sort of generate your, um, your payload files, you're welcome to do that as well. Hopefully we're all familiar enough with C programming where you guys can do that. But um, you have a few options for generating your payloads in this class. So, obviously, if I make that file, and you guys should go ahead and um, make that that file as well, using the Byte Writer program, we'll produce the uh, the file full of 128 bytes of dead beef. And then, if you come along here to um, the basic bone directory. Obviously, we're going to crash, right? We're clobbering the stack, and all kinds of bad things are happening. And so, this is the uh, the screen you're going to get in Windows when something bad happens. So, in Linux, we saw like segmentation called core dump. In Windows, this is what we see. So, if you're ever trying to open up a uh, PDF document from a strange email address, and instead of Adobe Reader, you see this, you should probably be nervous. Okay. Let me just make sure I keep up with my slides here. Okay, so I'm not going to bother showing you this in the Visual Studio project, but um, for this basic goal and a couple other mitigations we've turned off, like depth, um, I turned off in the Visual Studio project, like um, I turn optimizations disabled. This isn't a mitigation, but it just makes the uh, assembly that's produced more predictable, so it's a little bit easier to debug. And then I also turned off this um, GS protection, which is placing stack canaries on the stack, essentially. I'll talk more about that in day two. Uh, all these things are kind of like on by default in Visual Studio, so this slide's a little bit artificial, but in day two we'll be turning them back on. And um, Remember that one of the most important parts of exploits, one that I wanted you to take away, is that if you can hack something, you can crash it. Right? If you can change EIP to point to your shell code, obviously you can point EIP to a bogus address and you'll get a crash. So go ahead and make sure you can get a crash in basic bulm by giving it a payload that's too uh, too big. Have all you guys here in Bedford got a crash? Are all my BB cast people caught up and uh, able to get a crash as well with the big file? Not caught yet because you went a little fast. Which is the file which you're supposed to pass in? I ran Byte Writer and okay. then, but it looked like it didn't dump a file to local directory. So the uh, the path is hard coded in Byte Writer and something you can change obviously as well. And the path should be C colon slash class um, slash crash file. Let me change this these properties to make that a little bit.
So you're welcome to modify this thing, obviously, any way you want to. You might just want to make a bit backup copy if you break it. Um, usually I just use this to get started and then go into the hex editor HXD and manually edit the payload um, because that's a little bit easier to deal with. All right, how are my uh, remote guys doing? People getting crashes? Just go into the bug directory. Um, I'm getting can't open file. I can see that the uh, crash file exists and that it's 128 bytes, but when I run basic vuln.exe is equaling class slash crash file, it says can't open file. Is that a permissions thing? Can you uh, open it up in the hex editor and make sure that I, you know, just contains contents and so forth. Yep, definitely contains contents. Okay, is it uh, open with something else? Like, uh, you might just have to like reboot if there's like a file handle. Yeah, we said that hers is open, so like I'll that. just mess with mine. Okay, yeah, I'll just try to reboot. I haven't seen that problem yet arise. And this is a relatively new course, so um, we might have some little glitches, so please be patient as we work through it, especially in the fuzzing labs in day three where the results would get are a little bit non-deterministic. Corey, can you show so, your uh, terminal window or command prompt window again? All right, so basic loan C class. All right, cool. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So uh, once we all start getting crashes, we're first of all, can anyone tell me why it's crashing? Tell, can you tell me exactly what's happening? Flounder, you look like you know the answer. But what exactly is causing the crash? Before, without even looking at the debugger. Uh, Veronica, oh, you got the answer? Looks like it says the stack is corrupted, so probably return address is overwritten or something like that. I didn't open the debugger, by the way. Okay. Right. Right. So that is probably the most likely scenario, but that's um, not always the case when there's stack overflows. Oftentimes, you'll see that the exception is generated because we just write past the bounds of the stack. So the exception actually occurs before you even get to the bank return address. That's something we'll be abusing on day two. And we'll, I'll talk more about that later today, actually. But for now, let's um, go ahead and sort of confirm our suspicions by using the uh, debugger. So the, uh, the way to start WinDebug, the best way is to do WinDebug. You can do it just on the command line. Uh, dash QY, which kind of tells you, like, save your settings. Basic vulnerable.exe, the program we want to run, and the, the argument to it, the, uh, the path to the crash file. All right, you'll get something like this. And um, like I mentioned before, WinDebug takes some getting used to. It was obviously not designed by the Windows uh, GUI programming group. It was kind of like a tool by engineers for engineers, but it is very powerful and very useful once you get used to it. And um, I'll go over some more of the commands in a second. I actually have a sheet for you in the slides. If you just type G for like continue or run, um, when you first load it up, it's going to be stopped at this breakpoint, which is just kind of like, you know, okay, I'm about to run, set up your breakpoints or whatever. Then when you hit G for the first time, it's actually going to start executing. And in this case, we get a um, access violation because we overwrote the same return address with a deadbeat so that when it tried to uh, return, it said EIP equal to deadbeat, which is a bogus address, and then we got this uh, access violation. So uh, nothing too, too amazing, but... Um, Soon you'll be over annoyed when you see EIP equals dead I promise you. 
All right, if uh, everyone, all my VBCast guys, when you um, run WinDebug, do you see something similar? Can I just confirm that with you? Yeah, I do. And also, uh, when I rebooted the machine, it worked fine. OK. Yeah, so with everything with Windows, if anything isn't happening exactly, it's reboot. Hopefully, everything will be fine. That'll be especially true once we start trying to exploit um, these Windows vulnerabilities on day three and when you mess up. For any, can you show the uh, WinDebug command again to launch WinDebug since a few people are a little behind? Yeah. So what you guys should do is um, I would suggest is having a sheet of paper next to you where you write down some of these commands that I use so you can like kind of quickly reference them. Uh, this one should be pretty obvious, just typing when you go from the command line. The only weird part is this QI command, which, like I mentioned before, is just telling uh, WinDebug to save sort of the layout that you create in the WinDebug window. Does anyone here see the, uh, the pointing stick? It's like a piece of wood. You just point at things. Leave that thing. All right, looks like we're doing it without the, uh, the pointing rod. Okay, so everyone um, got WinDebug up and running? Ah, uh, well, like a caveman. So if you want, you can even fool around with WinDebug some. If you've uh, never seen this before, it can do all kinds of fun things. Like you can see more windows. Like disassembly is one we'll be using it. The awful part about WinDebug is getting it to put stuff where you want it to go. It's kind of like, okay, I've got this uh, disassembly window. Where do I want it to go? And just because I've used it a lot, I'm kind of good at manipulating it. But you'll probably end up with something like this. Ah, like, oh, I didn't want that. And uh, it'll take some practice to try to like you know, get it to put stuff where you want. I know that's frustrating, but you'll get better. Has everyone in here used one you've before, out of curiosity? You guys? OK, well, you're in for a treat. All right, so uh, nothing nothing amazing there. EIP equals dead beef. Um, what I want you guys to do as your first lab is um, make the prize function run. OK, so in uh, exploits one, we over, we exploited that basic login program by changing the return address to point at like the uh, successful login function. In this case, just to uh, get comfortable with debugging issues and building payloads, I want you to modify your payload so that the, um, the prize function runs. And in this case, you're not even having to like go and discover what the address of prize is. I'm literally just printing it out on the, um, in the output with a printf statement. So for the first lab, let's try to get prize run by changing the, um, the return address to point of prize. And one thing about this class, which I've failed to mention so far, is that let's assume we're in exploits one world and we're trying to get prize to run. Can anyone see any problems that would occur? Yeah. All the zeros in there? Yeah. So in Windows, all these addresses, like stack addresses, have zeros in them. Now, if you remember from exploits one, um, zeros were bad because if you had any zeros in your payload, if we're overflowing a function like string copy, or uh, anything that copies an ASCII string around, whenever it sees that 0, 0 value, it's going to assume this is the end of my string, um, so I'm not going to copy anything beyond this. So basically, you would get to, you know, like here, it's a little Indian, these things are in reverse, and say, all right, that's into my payload, and the rest of it would not get copied. However, in this class, all bytes are fair game. Everything in here is binary protocol, so you can use any bytes you want in your payload at all. This actually isn't too. Um, not realistic. Most of the vulnerabilities I see are in binary uh, binary protocols, and any type of binary data is going to be using functions like memcopy or whatever that is going, not going to discriminate against any of these bytes. So, a lot of the overflows vulnerabilities you see are in binary data, so you could use any of these bytes. But if we were having an overflow and um, string copy or something like that, you would have to carefully craft your payload so that you avoided all these um, null bytes and such. And I'll talk a little bit about how we would get around this null byte issue if it was a string copy or something like that. But the most important thing now is for the purposes of this class, you can use any bytes in your payload. Any bytes are fair game. 
All right, guys. So try to uh, craft your payload so that um, the price function runs. So the cheap way to do this would just be to like, you know, spam your whole payload file with the address of price. But if you want to be more precise about it, try to locate the exact offset in your payload file where that return address is getting overwritten and just replace that one instance with the address of the price function. Okay, while well, that's going, I guess I should um, tell you guys a little bit more about Win Debug so you have some more tools to help debug anything that you run into. Okay, so this is another sheet I'm giving you with uh, useful Win Debug commands. A lot of them are not very intuitively uh, named. So you might just want to tear this sheet out of your slide, um, your course slides, and just continue to write other commands you discover on there. But these are really the most important ones. So you can um, set a breakpoint with the BP command just by typing like BP, the symbol name, or the address. You can just give it an address. DB lets you look at arbitrary data. K displays stack frame information. You have these handy cursors in the beginning, or like you know, run to where the cursor is, or step out of functions, kind of ubiquitous uh, debugging technology. If you're single stepping and you use P, the P command is single step. It will step over function calls and T will step into them. Um, yeah, let me just show you a couple of these in the actual window. I hope you remember them better. So another really useful Wendy bug command that we'll be using a lot is this sort of evaluation mode, which we start with the question mark. And um, this lets you just sort of like uh, do arbitrary calculations in the command line. And it'll even like tell you, you know, what the value of registers are. So you can do like ESP, what is ESP plus 100? And it will tell you that. Or it's pretty smart about figuring out what you're trying to do. And it'll be using this to sort of calculate offsets and that sort of thing in the class. Uh, remember though that with WinDebug, everything you input is interpreted as hexadecimal. Right? So that's kind of an important point. Uh, it assumes everything, even if it's not proceeding with 0x, is hexadecimal 16 base. Uh, DD is an important one. It lets you just sort of inspect arbitrary memory. So kind of like the X command in GDB. In this case, it's telling me where the, uh, you know, what memory addresses I'm looking at, what its contents are. And the POI command interprets things as like as a pointer. So if I do DD POI ESP, it's going to look at that top value on the stack and interpret it as a pointer. So I'm basically telling it, you know, look at a dead beef, take the first value off the stack, interpret it, use it as a pointer and look at the memory there. So that's another useful one that we'll end up using a lot. Just try to uh, you know, have your sheet ready so you can look at all these, but it'll become second aid track for a while. Um, for my remote students, can you read that WinDebug output decently or should I try to change the font so it's more uh, legible for you? I can read it, but if you could make it a little bit okay. bigger, it would be better. Anyone here got the uh, prize function to give you?
How's everyone doing? Is anyone lost as to what we're supposed to be doing or how to accomplish it? Is anyone having wild success yet? What was the saying that we're supposed to say once we figure out? Once we get to work. Can anyone remember what the saying is that we use in the exploits class? Papa Legba, hear my call. But you have to say it with gusto this time so I can like edit that clip out and use it when I make like a, a medley of of OST video interesting bits. I'll have to wait till the right moment, like when we develop our uh, complicated payload that bypasses depth and all other kinds of nasty stuff and then I'll release a celebratory. Yep, sounds good. Cheer. It can only be reserved the finest moments though, like when you find that remote pre op zero dang to turn about the sickest exploit ever. Otherwise, you're blasting Apple Light Okay, so as many of you will see, like Samsung, when you get prized to run, it's going to run like multiple times. So while you're waiting on other people, you should try to investigate why that is with Windybug and try to just get it to print once. And part of how you can accomplish that, Sam, is try to um, just snipe that return address only overwrite it and nothing else past it. Right? So, in, um, in Windows exploits, we're talking about the real world here. We want our exploits to be as precise, as reliable as possible. So try to um, develop your payloads with science, not with brute force, just with um, you know, spamming addresses and so forth. Try to figure out exactly where in the payload file things are supposed to go. Try to avoid using no ops and stuff like that. Making things as price as precise as possible will pay dividends later when you're trying to make your exploits compatible across a wide variety of systems. All right. So Zeno got it to go with um, just one. How are people doing here? Price success. Yes. Papa Light boss in the house. Dan, how's it going over there? So I'll start working through um, how I would do this. I'll just show you how you do it with the, like, the Byte Writer program just so you guys can get comfortable with how that um, works. Okay, so um, first thing to know, what is the address of um, prize? So, got it? Well, prize is uh, 0040. I'm just going to write it here so I don't forget it. So 0040. One zero, zero, zero. Okay. And another important thing to remember, guys, is that you want to keep in mind what these addresses look like and what they represent, because it will help you a lot when you're debugging things and trying to figure out what's going on. Like when I see um, the address 004 beginning with a 4, I know that's kind of like the uh, text segment of my main process that I'm trying to attack, just because that's the way addresses are laid out in Windows. Whenever I see 12 F something 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 or 13 F something something something, and it's a stack address, that just helps me when I'm looking at kind of like raw output, like okay, that's a function pointer, that's a pointer to the text segment, that's a stack address, it's a keep address. So being familiar with these will help you out a lot in the long run. So I'm going to come to Byte Writer, and this is how I would modify the program. I'm just going to change the address it's emitting to that address the prize function. Let's 
sort of the, uh, the spam method that I'll show you guys here. Okay, so um, remember we have to put the, uh, the bytes backwards because we're in Little Indian land. Right? It's kind of like a weird still in X86 world. And then I'll just run this because the HXD automatically updated my file and it's contained this um, address. 128 bytes worth of it. Okay, so um, something isn't working uh, as land, so let's try to figure out why that's happening. So this will give you a good um, hint as to, you know, what you'll debug when your payloads aren't working as expected. Out of curiosity, this will let you guys' payloads look like, right? I'm not missing any obvious. Okay, so um, let's see, C class crash file. I'll try to the debugger. Oh, it's just printing it and crashing it. That wasn't something. Okay. Okay. So that's sort of the uh, the spam method. Um, I'll show you guys how you kind of calculate these things precisely uh, shortly. Okay, so as you know, you used the sort of sniper method. Um, you were able to calculate exactly where in the, um, the payload file the return address was being overwritten. And can you tell me how many bytes you had to write before you were overwriting that same return address? 64 bytes. Sixty-four bytes, huh? So if we come look at the source file, we should be able to guess, you know, based on the um, the source file, how many bytes we would have to write in theory to write the return address and so forth. So in this case, this is the buffer that we're overflowing at sixty-four bytes. So in like vanilla stack overflow, we would have to overwrite. Just get looking at the source code, probably 64 and plus 4 bytes for the saved frame pointer. So then after 68 bytes, we'd be overwriting the return address. But, um, you know, Visual Studio does a lot of weird things when it compiles stuff, like it will reorder variables. So this, um, these i and n's and buff might appear in different locations than where they're declared. And sometimes it'll change the size of like buffers you declare in sex because it's trying to do optimizations and so forth. And part of this variable rewarding is like a security mechanism. I'll talk about more in the exploits uh, in day two, where it's going to try to relocate any buffers that it deems might be overflowable so that it can't overwrite any um, other local variables. So we'll like try to put this above the stack and these below it so these can't be corrupted by the um, overflowing buff, but get more than that in day two. So let's go ahead and try to calculate exactly where that return address was appearing. I'll show you how I do that when, when you look. Okay. So, here's what I'll do. It's always a good thing to do when you're developing a vulnerability. You want to set a, um, or developing an exploit, set a breakpoint right before you corrupt the process. So in this case, the call to F read is the call that's going to be corrupting the process and sort of look at the state of the program. And then right afterwards, the corruption occurs, the overflow or whatever, look at the state of the process again, just so you can see that everything is as you expect it to be, because oftentimes something wasn't um, quite right. 
So um, as soon as you make us the office of the heat down, then mine should be the same, but we'll see. The stack, the stack is kind of a dynamic in Windows. It changes a lot. So hard coding stack addresses into your payload is often kind of a no-no, but we'll talk more about that later. Okay. So I want to set a breakpoint right before the uh, this F3 comes in and corrupts my stack. So I'm going to set my cursor here and do a run to cursor. And uh, the reason this is taking so long is because it's trying to resolve a bunch of symbols, I believe. So let me see if I... So sometimes in WinDebug, you're going to get this kind of like um, loop of doom as when WinDebug is trying to resolve like a bazillion symbols. So if you ever see that and you want it to stop, just hit this button like a bazillion times and then eventually it will stop. Okay, so finally it did stop here for me actually when it resolved this symbol. So at this point I've broken on this part of the program. N equals F read, you know, the vulnerable call the F read. But this uh, level of granularity isn't good enough because for every line of C programming there's a lot of like, you know, assembly opcodes happening in the background. And um, we want to stop actually right before the actual call, not just on the line. So we can switch to disassembly mode. If you don't have the screen up, if you go to view and disassembly, it, it will appear for you. And I can see down here, I'm actually right at like a 1076. And the call is actually a few instructions later to call the F read. And in between, it's like setting up the stack and the arguments to F read. Now I just want a single step till I get to that call so I can uh, look at the state of the program right before the corruption occurs. And uh, the single step in this disassembly mode, you need to switch to uh, turn source mode off. Because when you're in this mode right here, and you thought the single step, it's kind of single step like a single line of code, not a single instruction. Okay, so once we're in this sort of binary mode, then we can use the T command, the single step. Just want to single step down to that call to F read. Hey, Corey, we had a question. How did you set the breakpoint? Okay. So the way I set the breakpoint was um, I just put my cursor on this line, n equals f read, and then I did run to cursor. And you might have to do that twice. Like sometimes it will hit like a Windows, your debugging breakpoint before you actually get to the breakpoint you wanted. But when this is highlighted with blue, that means you're actually on broken in this line of code. Reading our payload into, and where is the return address on the stack, and what is the delta between the two. And these are how we figure that out. So if we do DDESP, I can even do DDESP L4, and 4 means I want 4. So describe D word starting at ESP and give me 4 of them. You have to use L4 for whatever reason L is the, uh, the size operator there. The T command? Huh? It, it didn't go for you? Yeah, it's because you have to uh, put this thing right here. Yeah. So you can do a dot restart to rerun the program and kind of re re get to that point because you probably uh, step past where we want to be. So describe D word starting ESP. Give me four of them. And these are the this tells me these are the arguments that were passed to the um, the vulnerable read file. 
So who can tell me, looking in this output, what the address of the buffer is that we're um, overflowing? You should be able to tell either by the way the addresses look or by the order they appear on the stack. Dave, can I answer for <laughs> The address of the buffer network overflow. Yeah. I think it's 0012 FF20. Yeah, and how did you derive that? Um, well, I immediately threw out the 0180. Yeah. Um, just those, those are my focus addresses. And so I uh, decided to look at things that would most likely be on the heap itself. So you could just recognize these addresses. Like I know that 12FF or 13FF is a stack address. And I know that the buffer I'm reading into is like a stack buffer. So that's one way you can do it. Another way is by looking at the order these appear on the stack. So when, right before the call, the top thing on the stack should be the, uh, the first argument to the function. And the first argument to fread is the buffer you want to read into. And you would obviously only know that if you knew what the, um, the prototype was for fread, but you will eventually. So 12FF20 is the address of our buffer. Now we want to figure out where on the stack our return address is. What register points in the general vicinity of our return address? Think about how stack frames EBP. are created. Yeah, so EBP to point, what does EBP actually point at in the general x86? Paradigm. Obviously, it can vary depending on how the compiler um, chooses to generate your code, but in most cases, EBP points at the saved frame pointer. And then right after that is the return address. You. Okay. So in this case, you know, sort of, I turned off all kinds of optimization and stack canary, so it should be pretty um, vanilla stack frame. And pointing at EBP is the, uh, the save frame pointer. And then right after that is the save return address. And if I want to verify that's the return address, I can use the u command to disassemble that address. And I can see it points back into the main function. It's like the return address in the main. And um, this tells me that it's a return address because right after a call, it's doing a uh, Add ESP to like clean up stuff that was pushed onto the stack. Clean up the stack after the call. Okay, so what this means is that my return address is stored at one two FF seven four. Is this is 12FF70. This is what's at 12FF70. And this is what's at 12FF74. Okay. So I want to calculate the delta in between my saved return address and the buffer that I'm overflowing. So this is the same number that Zeno got, I believe. It OX 54 bytes into the payload file is uh, where we'd be writing the return address. Or in other words, after we've overwritten um, OX 54 bytes into the buffer, we'll then start to be able to write that, uh, that same return address. And so to test that out, I could come to my payload file and come to OX54 and change this to like a bogus value. 
you can delete all this stuff. And then if I were to run this again, I should see EIP equals AAAA and I crash, obviously, because that's not a valid address. So if I was to do restart, <coughs> I get EIP equals AAAA. So we'll be doing this sort of thing a lot. We're calculating um, the deltas between things and where, there's, where in our file we'll be overwriting certain things. So we'll get a lot of practice doing this. I just wanted to show you my general method for um, how I accomplish this sort of thing. Okay. So, one thing that Xeno did, which a lot of exploit developers do, is they'll hack in kind of like a U. When they know they're overriding a function pointer with their, their data, but they're not really sure which part of their data is overriding the function pointer, They'll change their payload to like a unique pattern. So I can have A1, A2, A3, A4, B1, B2, B3, et cetera, et cetera. And then they know when the program crashes if EIP equals, you know, A4, B1, B2, B3, we'll know exactly where in the payload they're overriding that function pointer. However, we want to be scientific in this class, so we're not going to, I'm going to discourage that type of behavior because we want to know how to calculate these things Precisely. In the real world, if you're trying to develop an exploit as quickly as possible for whatever reason, you would just develop this unique pattern thing. And Metasploit actually has a module that will generate a random pattern for you like this. And it'll help you figure out, you know, kind of like programmatically do this and figure out where things are in your payload. But um, we want to do it the scientific way with WinDebug and with Mac. So, did everyone get prized to run? Yep, good. All my VBCast people got prize to run. Were there any questions about how I calculated that offset precisely? Has anyone wildly confused at what I did there? Obviously, some of the Windy Bug commands um, were a bit strange, but you'll be used to it. We'll, we'll be doing that a lot in this class. Okay, so what I want you guys to do now is a little experiment. Um, change your payload, you can just use the spam method to overwrite EIP with the address of noops. And what noops is, is um, just a buffer I created, you know, like a static buffer with these bytes, OX90, 9090, which is the opcode for um, do nothing. But does anyone remember what it actually does from Zeno's x86 class? Zeno can't answer. So, yeah. Isn't it moved from one register to the same register? Exchange. Yeah, exchange EAX, EAX, I believe. But um, OX90 is the opcode for uh, do nothing. So I want you to try to point EIP at these OX90s. And Sam got it right, apparently. And um, see if you can get that to work. And with this, you won't know that it's actually uh, working, obviously, since it's not printing any output. So you can actually set a breakpoint on the, uh, the no ops. So I'll go ahead and do it up here, too. This is just sort of like a little mini lab. I'm not concerned you guys doing this. Uh, let's see. Anyone read off what the address of no ops is for me? It should appear in your output actually. O O four O and you're doing backwards. Yes. One eight three zero four zero zero zero. Okay. And then um Check HXT to make sure that I know a little bit.
You always want to make sure with, just confirm with HXD that your payload was updated correctly. Sometimes that won't if like the permission is denied to open the file because it's a file and a load or something like that. So here it is. Here's my no op spam payload. And if I just run this without the debugger, It's not going to be clear that it worked, but it's going to get this crash. So, if we want to confirm that it's actually executing something, executing those no ops, what I would do is um, actually tell it to set a breakpoint on the no ops with this type of syntax BP, basic, bolon, bang, uh, no ops. There. And if I did a G, you know, eventually it would say EIP go to the no ops so that I know that it's um, actually executing this. And what I'll do now, and you guys uh, don't necessarily have to do this, just want to show you, is I'm going to reboot into debt mode and show you what happens. So I know guys that this is going a little bit slow at this point. This is all kind of like old hat for most of you, but just bear with me as we become to a point debug and I promise we'll pick up the pace soon and learn all kinds of new exciting things. In general, day one will be a little bit slow, day two and day three will get a lot faster. Corey, I would say the, uh, the pace is decent for the online because we have to flop back and forth between the windows and it makes it take a little bit longer. Okay, good to know. So every once in a while, I want to just sort of take a measurement of the class barometer and see how everyone's morale is doing with this kind of stuff. I realize that at times it can be very demoralizing to be staring the windy bug and like, how oh, the hell is this working? Or is going too slow or too fast? So at this point, everyone doing okay with the pace, right? Anyone really bored at this point? Just keep in mind the end result. This journey, we have to take many arduous steps, but by the end. We're able to develop cool exploits so that when people browse to our websites, all kinds of crazy calculators will pop up on their computer. Same result that we want to get. Okay. So I'm going to just repeat the same thing that I just did. And look, it appeared to work, but this is something you need to make note of because this is going to appear in day two. It looks like it worked, but it actually didn't. We're not actually executing these new op instructions. Instead, WinDebug is telling us access violation. All right, so that can be a little bit tricky because you're like, yes, it's working, but actually it's not working because Def is coming and said, guess what? You're pointing EIP at a data region, and uh, that's a no-no. So I'm not actually going to execute this. I'm just going to lose access violation. And we'll talk about how we uh, get around that tomorrow. Um, anyone that just followed that lab with me, just make sure you reboot back with that turned uh, off. Okay, so those couple of smaller labs 
quickly about just uh, re-familiarize what these stack overflows look like and how you exploit stack overflows. In this class, we'll only be dealing with Windows stack stuff um, because Windows heap stuff is super gnarly. Um, so we're not going to bother talking about it. It takes a really long time to develop a reliable Windows heap exploit. Uh, but contrary to popular belief, some people would tell you that um, stack overflows don't exist anymore, or you know, they're not around, or exploit mitigations rather than not exploitable. That's totally false. There are still a heinous amount of stack overflows out there in production enterprise software that people use. All right, I'll, I'll just tell you that. Um, that is definitely true, no matter what anyone tries to tell you about memory corruption bugs being super rare and not existing anymore. Patently false, they are definitely out there. I still see all kinds of products that use like um, vulnerable calls to scan F or sprintf, even in like commodity software that's widely used. Still something needs to go there. So this is all totally um, applicable to real world developing uh, exploits in real world software. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning of class that I'm not going to talk about Windows Shell Kit development too much because it's really hairy and I don't think you guys would like the lab so much because it's kind of so gnarly. And most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't have to develop your own shell code, you're just going to be going to Metasploit and telling it to generate it for you. It's one thing Metasploit is very good at. Um, but I do want to sort of at a fast pace go over the differences between Linux and Windows shell code development and the kind of stuff you, have, you run up against if you're trying to develop your own custom Windows shell code. Okay. So, as a gentle introduction to why these things are so gnarly and harder than each other, this is a Linux kind of like Hello World style shellcode. This is basically what you developed in Exploits 1. If you guys to go to that, uh, do that lab where you made your own shellcode. And this is an equivalent shellcode in Windows. A lot bigger and a lot nastier. And you can notice that one doesn't even bother to take out the null bytes and so forth. If you want to do that, you'd have to make it even bigger and trickier. Okay. So in Linux, the reason why these things are so different, why Linux shellcode is so much easier than Windows shellcode, is because Linux has this handy interrupt OX80 or I guess different X64 system call interface, where you know you set some registers, some values, and you tell the assembly to interrupt OX80, and then the operating system does a, a system call for you. Um, Windows does have a system call interface. But it is not used by shellcode for a number of reasons. One is that in Linux, the, the system call interface is like set in stone. You know that, you know, EAX equals one, I think it is, is the exit system call. Two is that, three is this. this these things never change. They are hard coded. This is a system call interface. It's like a specification that is not changing. In Windows, you're not really supposed to use these things directly. And the interface for them, how you call them, is constantly changing between service packs and so forth, like um, setting how you would call one system call is going to vary a lot between service pack levels. So trying to make a reliable shellcode using this interface is it's not going to work out since it's such a dynamic, um, undocumented, unused interface. Also, in Linux, we have some really powerful system calls, like we can do socket and network code operations with socket calls, and Windows we cannot. There is no socket interface um, reachable via the Windows system call interface. So in Windows, we're usually interested in sort of remote shellcode if we're talking about a real attack or offensive scenario. If we just pop up command.exe or a calculator on someone's computer, you know, that's all great, but it's not actually accomplishing our objectives as an attacker. What we want your computer to actually do is instead of rendering that PDF document, we want your computer to go out connect to a command and control channel or go and download something. So generally we're always talking about some type of a network interaction, exfiltrating data or something like that. And this network code that you need is not reachable by the Windows system call interface. You have to use WinSock and the WinSock DLL. Okay.
Okay. So the general way you develop um, shell code in Windows is since you can't use a system call interface, you traverse the address, the process address space. I'm going to go really high, high level here and wave my hands around a lot so I don't have to go into it too much. Is we traverse the victim process address space looking for key DLLs located in the victim process address space like kernel32.dll that contain these important system call like functions that we want to use. Um, the first thing you generally do is you locate, located it um, in Windows everything has what's called like the, the PEB and the TEB, the process execution block and the thread execution block. And from there, there's like a linked list that points to all the DLLs loaded by the process that, by the pro, in the process address space. And one of those DLLs is in variable kernel32.dll, kernel 32 which every process has. So we um, start at the TEB, which is pointed at by the FS register. Just the convention windows of the FS segmentation register going into the tab. Traverse this link list, it gets us to kernel32.dll. A lot of the structures that we're having to traverse are undocumented, so you got to figure all that out for yourself. Eventually, we discover what the base address is of kernel32.dll by traversing that link list. Then, we parse kernel32.dll's export address table to discover the locations of two key functions, load library and git proc address. And load library lets us load arbitrary DLLs into a process address space. So we can tell us that if we just have like a calculator program that doesn't use Windows sockets, we can tell it to load winsock.dll. All of a sudden we'll have a Windows socket programming library in there. And also git proc address, which tells us the address of where functions are located in the DLL. And so at that point, we've located the address of kernel of um, load library and git proc address. We use them to load in more DLLs to accomplish our shellcode's objective, like um, Windows socket programming DLLs. We use git proc address to figure out the address of those functions in that DLL that we want to call. And then eventually we, um, we call. So we have to, just to reiterate, go to the tab. The thread execution block, which is located at the FS register, parse the crazy link list, find the address of kernel32.dll. Um, once we found the address of kernel32.dll, we have to parse this export address table, locate the address of load library and git proc address, use those functions to load in DLLs that we are using to accomplish our code's objective, and then eventually call those functions to do whatever we want. So doing all that is um, pretty gnarly, but I talk about it in great detail in these slides. So like I said, if you do, um, any sort of malware analysis, I highly recommend you look at these because it can be a little bit hard to find um, thorough documentation on these methods. And I highly so recommend you take the Life of Binaries class to learn more about the PE headers. Right, right. Um, this kind of material, if you take in Life of Binaries, it will make a lot more a lot more sense because we're talking about how the Windows loader is working and what all these structures actually look like, but um, you know, if you're interested in this, I have some mini labs in these slides that I describe them in great detail. And there's also some source code on there um, for the labs in the class directory. So please look at that on your own time, but I'm not going to cover it because I don't really have good labs um, for this stuff because it's so kind of hairy. And I want to uh, stick to a lab driven course because I was probably talk end up talking about Windows Shell code for three hours and then you guys would just be put to sleep and wouldn't remember it. Okay. Um, for this class, we're only going to be using this shell code, which I generated with Metasploit. Unfortunately, I, I avoided putting Metasploit on these virtual machines, so you can't generate your own custom shell code because our company freaks out about Metasploit for whatever reason, because they think that uh, Metasploit is going to become self-aware and start attacking people on our network. So. What I did was I just used Metasploit to generate a uh, calc.exe spawning shellcode. And I put this all in your virtual machines in multiple forms. Um, so if you go to the class directory, in Byte Writer, I have the um, 
to like see array for the shell code already declared so you can use it here if you're using a byte writer. And I also have it just as a raw binary file in the class directory and calc shellcode.bin. And so what I usually end up doing is I just, once I have my payload in place and I'm executing some trivial like a CC software breakpoint shellcode, I just copy and paste with HXD, literally copy and paste the shellcode into my payload. Into my payload. But you have the shellcode exists in a variety of ways and you can use it to get into your payload however you want. I tried to give you some options. One thing everyone hated about Exploits 1 was having to manually type out uh, you know, curl string with the shellcode they generated. So here it is, guys. I heard your complaints. It's just right here. You can just copy and paste away until your heart's content. So, uh, and yeah, this is just metasploit calc.exe spotted shellcode. There you go. It's the only shellcode we're interested in this, interested in this class. Like I mentioned before, um, all the cool hacker people, they demonstrate how awesome they are by making calculator appear on your computer. So that's what everyone does. But in the real world, you would replace this um, shell code or something that went and downloaded a rootkit or connected back to a server that provided a command and control channel or exfiltrated some documents or something like that. All right, guys. So um, I'm going to give you guys a little break. But before that, I want to introduce the next lab. So that anyone that wants to, um, you know, use their break to work on this thing has the opportunity to. In Windows, 99% of the time, we do not have access to source code for applications that we want to exploit. Um, if we're lucky, we have public debugging symbols, which will tell us what function names are and stuff like that. But a lot of times, we don't even have that. Um, Mystery.exe is a binary that I've given you. I have provided you the public symbols, but not private symbols and no source code. And I want you to try to, um, to exploit it. Um, the vulnerability is similar to what you saw in basic bulb, but the code is a little bit different. So you're going to have to use WinDebug, try to figure out what's going on, uh, how your payload enters into the program, where it enters into the program, what you're overriding, and basically just use WinDebug to investigate what's going on. Because in the Windows world, with these proprietary applications we're trying to exploit, we often have no idea what the hell is going on when we start out. So we have to use our debugger to figure out where the vulnerability is, where the vulnerability is how we get at it, how the program works, etc. So I want to give you guys some practice on doing that. Um, the starting point for this lab is set a breakpoint on the main function mystery bang main, hit the breakpoint, look at the disassembly, try to figure out what's going on. So this binary should be here, mystery.exe. And uh, this .pdb file is the uh, public symbol file which should give you the function names and so forth. And I'm not going to tell you anything more about the program at this point. I want you guys to suffer some and try to figure out what's going on because suffering is the, uh, the mother of learning. The more you suffer, the more you'll learn. So this is what you're trying to exploit. I'll give you guys two options. You can either try to make the calculator shellcode appear using that calc.bin shellcode to make a calculator appear. Or you can do it the easier way and you can just use um, like a 4-byte shellcode or a 1-byte shellcode and make EIP point at this, XCC, XCC, XCC. And what this will do is if you run into the debugger, it'll generate a software breakpoint when you start running the shellcode so that you'll know, okay, I am running, I'm executing attacker injected x86 instructions. So for all intents and purposes, um, that means that you want. But if you want to take it a step further, you can um, get help to pop up. I will say that it is not a one-step process to go from this to the calculator. The reason being is the place where you put this CC shellcode um, 
there might not be enough room for the calculator to show up. I don't know. I'll let you guys work on that for a little bit. So, to get started, Windy Bug. Alright. Or the QI are QI just means like save my um, workspace information. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you would have to set these windows up kind of like each time you ran. And it will, like we'll remember how you position your windows and we'll just start with the default assembly window. So there it is. Entry point. This is a uh, a program from uh, some vendor that doesn't release their source code. It's a proprietary program. You have no idea what it does, but you know that it runs on the organization's computers who you are targeting. So you want to find a vulnerability in it. You have no idea what it does. So you're going to use Windybug to investigate what it's doing, where the vulnerability is, and you're going to try to get um, shellcode to execute. 